I watch a movie like The Godfather 2 and they eat pasta in that one scene where they decide they're going to they're gonna knock off Don Cheech. And just watching them eat the pasta makes me hungry. Well, it's the same thing when I watch a YouTube video and I see someone's hand open and close a knife over and over. And I hear the sounds and I see them fondle it, moving it around in their hands. That is what has moved me to buy more knives than anything else right. in the last 10 years. Right. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from theknifejunkie.com. And we've got a good show for you today. We're a little fat and happy from the Thanksgiving holiday, but uh, still hopefully we can trudge through this with all the turkey on us. Indeed, James. I, uh, <laughs> in, Jim, I'm sorry. I called you James. Hey, James is my middle, my James. full name. <laughs> I'm not your father, though. I ate myself into oblivion. I haven't yes. done that in a while. I was uncomfortable and uh, real grouchy for half of Thanksgiving yeah. this year. Well, I want to hear if you actually got to use any of your knives for Thanksgiving, maybe carving the turkey or something like that. Well, you know I did, Jim. Yeah, I know you did. Coming up, like I said, we've got a good show. We've got our normal couple of segments. Uh, this one is going to be Maintenance Minute, and we've got a Ships in the Night uh, segment coming up. But this episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast, we're kind of finished up with our Knife 101, although we may go back and talk about specifics, those kind of things right. on future episodes. From time episode. to time, we'll yeah. come back for a yeah. full episode about the Bowie or the Kukri or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But today we're going to kind of dive more into the Knife Junkies collection, kind of talk about some of the uh, things that uh, interest you about the knives, why you started collecting the knives, and why specifically some of these knives. So we're going to have a, a good show coming up where we'll dive into uh, some of the Knife Junkie favorites to talk about. Roger that, Jim. But before we start, i got to ask you, as always, what are you carrying today? What's got, in your pocket? got my normal uh, Swiss, Army, Swiss Army knife. Oh, nice. <laughs> Nice. Did you use that over Thanksgiving? Uh, a little bit with the knife for opening some boxes and, you know, some packages of food and those kind of things. But, right. Yeah. Right. But and I bet you found it was remarkably dull. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just busting. No, you are. You're true. So, uh, today I got, I have a Victorinox actually. I saw that. I have this, uh, Victorinox camper that was uh, gifted to me from my brother. He left it in a guitar case that he gave me. Well, uh, I mentioned it in a previous yeah, podcast. Yeah. I finally got it sharpened up. And uh, looped up, and I was going to give it back to my brother, and he said, "No, that's yours." So uh, it's uh, it's great to have in pocket. It's right. got a lot of tools, especially right. the corkscrew. That's what I'm yeah. most interested yeah. in. Well, it sounds like my Swiss Army may have to go to you for the uh, spa treatment. Oh, this is yes, indeed the spa treatment. Everyone needs it now and again. I also have the Spiderco Patata on me today, and uh, when we talk about uh, knife collecting, when we get a little bit into how and why I knife collect. This is uh, emblematic of this Spyderco Patata. Beautiful knife. It looks very much like your typical Spyderco, except different. <laughs> different angles, different handles and such. But uh, this really calls to me because it comes from the island of Sardinia, an Italian island. And so I had to get it because I am of Italian extraction and I get sentimental about things. And mm -hmm. knife collecting is one of them. So okay. I'll, I'll talk about that later. All right. All right. And, of course, we have in your pocket. Oh, oh, yeah. As always. <laughs> right. In my uh, hip, my waistband at 3 o'clock is the pink cold steel broken skull with the snaggle tooth wave opener on it. Yeah. Just and, in case the shit goes down. Right. And maybe one day we'll talk about why you always carry that yeah. one, because that's a constant. <laughs> like, my Swiss Army knife is, is mine. Yeah. That's one of your three that you always carry. Exactly. Yeah. But you did get a new knife we're going to talk about in the Ships in the Night segment coming up. We also have our maintenance minute, which is coming up momentarily. Slip joint pivot care, which should be a good one. Yeah. But I'm really interested in hearing about how the knife junkie got started in collecting knives and talk about some of your knives uh, in our main show segment, which is coming up after our maintenance minute. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, and now it's time for this week's Maintenance Minute. Part of a knife junkie's calling is the maintenance and loving care of the knives he or she carries and uses. Ubiquitous to modern folding knife construction is the ability for the end user to take the thing apart and maintain it down to its component parts. Often we take our knives apart to get to know them better, to clean out the works and improve the action, you know, make it ours. But that's not so easy to do with most traditional knives, which are pinned together. I mean, when was the last time you took apart a slip joint and then got it back together? So how do you improve the action on a slip joint or otherwise pinned together pocket knife? Well, here's what I do. In the absence of purpose-built knife lubricants, I use gun oil on my pinned knife pivots. 
I figure gun oil is created for metal parts that move at higher rates of speed uh, and in way more physically stressful situations, so it should be more than adequate for a grandpa knife. I apply the gun oil liberally to the knife tang in the closed position, in the half-opened and fully open positions. Then holding the blade with a doubled-over rag, and then holding the handle in my other hand, I open and close the blade quickly, never fully closing it, but working the oil around the pivot with the repeated motion. Then I stop and mop away the blackened oil as it oozes from the back spring. Then open and close again. Open and close. Open and close. That's it. Starting with generous amounts of oil and lots of motion really helps to clear out dirt and grit from the pivot, thus improving the action. You can tell by how black the used oil gets. If you really want to get OCD about it, keep it this process until the oil comes back clear. Then you know you've done all you can for the action of the pivot on that traditional or pinned pocket knife. That's this week's Maintenance Minute, and now more of the Knife Junkie Podcast. All right, we're back on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Follow up on the uh, maintenance minute there, Bob. The yeah. slip joint pivot care, the the uh, the oil that you use is that commonplace. You can yeah. get it pretty much anywhere. You can get it anywhere. I got mine at Dick's Sporting Goods. It's Hops Number Nine is what I use. But, okay. Uh, it's just uh, you get any sort of gun cleaning kit or rifle kit, and they'll have a lubricant in there. It right. comes with a little uh, spray nozzle, kind of like mm. WD forty. Okay. Okay. You can approximate accuracy with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And of course, you can get it online at. Uh, oh, sure. You can Amazon. Get it on Amazon. That's where I'll yeah. get it next yeah. time. No okay. doubt. Well, if you'd like to uh, get some knife oil or any of the other stuff, maybe some stropping materials that we talked about, I think, on last uh, last episode, uh, go to Amazon.TheKnifeJunkie.com and you can get all your supplies there and help support the podcast. We do get a small commission, but it does not increase the price you pay. So just uh, show some love to the show, Amazon.TheKnifeJunkie.com. So let's talk about knives, Bob. All right. Well, <laughs> Your collection. When Why I t- did you get into it and that kind of thing? When I, when I think about my collecting, the base theme that comes up is needs versus wants. Mm. And I come every time to the depressing conclusion that my needs list is very short. My wants right, list is very right. long. Right. Um, actually, knives are something that I really actually work into my life. I, I really, um, I'm kind of depressed to say this, Jim, but in a way, I could probably get by with just that Swiss Army knife. Mm. I mean, it has so many different more tools True. than the than the knives I prefer to collect, right. than the knives that have prestige, so to speak. So if we were just going by needs, I could probably just have a Victorinox Classic, like the tiny one I have on my keychain, right. and get along fine. Right. But it's not a matter of that. <laughs> no. Wants come into it. And I think what you have to do before you admit that you're a knife collector is admit a, to a certain amount of materialism. These knives that we collect, that we love to have, that we love to carry multiples mm-hmm, on mm-hmm. and fondle, these things are just things. There mm-hmm. are things that we don't really need, but there is an appeal to how much care goes into their design, right. how much care goes into their uh, manufacture, mm-hmm. and and then the thought of something that will outlive you because... You know, you hear about heirloom quality knives. Well, everything you see here in front of you, even the cheapest plastic thing, is heirloom quality. It's all going to outlast you. Mm -hmm. Even the even the twenty dollar cold steel, right? It's going to outlast you, right? Well, we talked about in the intro uh, show, double zero, Mm kind of you know who we are, getting to know you, that kind of thing. Your background uh, has a lot to do with it, kind of the art interest and and that the art that you have and that you do, as well as the martial arts training that you do. So a lot of these factors mm-hmm. also lead to some of the collectability for at least you of some of the knives that you collect. Right. Actually, you're keying into something very important, and and that is justification. I I've always been aware of my um, highly advanced sense of justification. So if I want something. <laughs> I can come up with great arguments right. to, to, maybe I should have been a lawyer, Jim. <laughs> then we wouldn't be sitting here talking. No well, doubt. you'd have a huge collection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not the meager one I'm suffering through right, right no, now. I'm sure you have plenty, <laughs> plenty. But, but it's this, um, it's this idea that justifying your purchase. As an artist, I am justified in buying knives that, uh, that a lot of design care have, go- has gone into. Mm-hmm. I, I am justified as an artist to buy, uh, you know, a crazy looking knife like the ZT0055, which basically looks like a stealth jet. It's got all these facets and angles and it's uncomfortable in the hand and everything else, but I love it. But who cares? Exactly. <laughs> so as an artist, it's justified. That purchase is justified. Now, as a martial artist, right. 
all of the Emerson knives I buy are justified. All the combative knives, all of the okay. crazy cold steel knives that, you know, are all overkill. They're all justified by the fact that, Jim, I know what I'm doing with a knife, damn right, it. Right, right. And, and therefore... someday the zombies may attack and you'll need it. <laughs> well, you know, you laugh, but it's the truth. But it's there, right. So why why else collect knives? I mean, we kind of touch on this in the intro section, getting to know your intro show, getting to know you. But why again collect knives? And and I know you've s- focused on a couple of categories because they're uh, you know the the weapon functionality, maybe the uniqueness of design. Are there other particulars for you that then to your collection? Uh, well, two others. Okay. One of them is pure sentimentality. That mm. is, someone buys me a knife. Someone knows I'm a knife knife guy, and they buy me something and. Even if I don't like it, or it isn't a knife I would pick out for myself, I hold it dear. I love it. I'll never right. get rid of it because I gave because it it's to a you thoughtful gift. Right, right. How many times do you just get an Amazon gift card, which is also cool because you can purchase knives with it? Right. But I mean, right. You know, it's nice to see someone thought right. a little bit deeper right. and bought you that gift. So sentimentality is a big okay. one. For well, that's a great. You one. know, I told you I'm Italian, so sentimentality oh. kind of comes with the package. And um, also, my my well. I'm a user too. I mean, as much as I, as I downplay that because I'm not working on an oil rig or, you know, uh, a, a cattle rancher, I still do use my knives in my sprawling, uh, backyard estate, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, so there are some knives like, uh, my Tops knives, my Tex Creek, my Ontario machete, um, my Cold Steel Vaquero. These are knives that I use outside. I mentioned them in, in previous podcasts. Those are my backyard knives, and and I actually do a lot of work with them. So, in essence, I could have a four knife collection and, mm-hmm. and actually be happy and be able to get by. Right. Well, you'd be able to get by. Yes. You might not be happy. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so also, Jim, no, go ahead. let me let me interrupt you. One thing I'm yeah. realizing now, as I get older, I become more interested in history, and a lot of the knives that I get mm, interesting. are based on histor- modernized versions, modernized interpretations of historical knives, like mm. the patata I'm carrying in my in my pocket today. This is a this is a modern take by Spyderco mm-hmm. on a traditional Sardinian folding pocket knife that people in Sardinia have carried for generations, and uh, it's used for everything from cutting cheese to you know protecting yourself. I would assume, right. and there is an appeal to that in, personally. Uh, due to my my ethnic link, but also it is an interesting variation on a typical spider code design. Okay, you have this, I was going to say, what's the variation? Well, you have this raised hump at the back of the spine for you to put your thumb on this thumb ramp. Oh, okay. Usually, spider code jimps that puts uh puts a grip shin there so that your thumb okay. doesn't slip. They left that off there. This sort of leaf shaped blade is very typical of a spider code, but here you see this abrupt angle change here to that very very pointy tip. That is a reference to the original, the the original patata knife. Mm. This, so this is a very Spyderco interpretation of the patata knife. Mm. And as you can see, there's the the trademark round opening. Hole. Right. And what is that for? This is for opening the blade. Oh, okay. So you just put your thumb in that hole. Okay. Interesting. Push it out. But there are other ways you can flick it. Right. With your thumb, you can flick it with your middle finger, and then you can do what's called a spidey drop, which is just hold the blade and drop it. Oh, nice. These are all, these are all, uh, emblematic of that hole. Um, but also you've got this beautifully sculpted, uh, G10 handle. If, if you can see how that is radiused, so the handle is contoured and rounded, and that takes a lot of machine time. So that goes into the cost of the knife, uh, et cetera. So the, the historical aspect of knives is an, is an interesting, um, avenue mm-hmm. for collecting, mm-hmm. I think. And all the little different features that you talked about, I, I'm thinking just off the top of my head, there could be tens of hundreds of variations on a knife by tens of dozens of manufacturers of knives. I mean, it, you know. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, and, and if you go on to Blade HQ and just uh, go down that rabbit hole, you will see them all. Yeah. It is a, a great big wide world of knives. And the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, before 10 years ago, before 15 years ago, before YouTube and, and the, and the popularization of folding knives just through the watching, you know, Jim, I watch a movie like The Godfather 2 and they eat pasta in that one scene where they decide they're gonna, they're gonna knock off Don Cheech and just watching them eat the pasta makes me hungry. Well, it's the same thing when I watch a YouTube video and I see someone's hand open and close a knife over and over and I hear the sounds. And I see them fondle it, moving it around in their hands. That is what has moved me to buy more knives than anything else right. in the last 10 years. Right. I'm a sucker. Right. <laughs> so you want that knife. 
Yeah, and then watching it <laughs> makes me Jones for that night, right? You know, and then go buy that knife. Yeah, it's well. There is a keeping up with the Joneses aspect to uh-huh. it. You know, every new every new year, right? All the manufacturers come out with cool new designs, mm-hmm. and you want it, and you see other people have it, and in a way, you want it too because mm-hmm. it looks so good to hold and to flip like they do in the right, videos. Gotcha. But really, the question is: Are you keeping up with the Joneses, or are you just Jonesing? Like a like a like a knife junkie, All right. you know. So when we're talking about collecting knives, am I better off as a knife newbie to start collecting brand new knives? As you say, they're coming out with new models every year. They've got new handles or covers or the Christmas edition, those kind of thing. Or am I better off as a a collector to look at older knives, maybe knives that have been used? I mean, is there is there well, you, you threw, different perspectives there? You threw the word "collective" in in air quotes, and I'm just wondering: Do you mean collector as someone who who is collecting for the value and for the possible resale mm-hmm. value, or you know, my collection is totally personal; it, it's my tastes right, and, gotcha. and that yeah. kind of thing. I never buy anything with the with the thought that I'm going, going to, to sell it. Sell, yeah. Well, see, and that's where I'm coming at it differently. Because yeah. I have not yet developed the knife Jones yet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the knife junkie yet. So, so it's something that so that, that's an interesting point though that you bring up. Well, some some people do that. They wait for the new drops, they buy it immediately, and then turn it around on the secondary market and sell it for a, a much inflated price. Oh, okay. And in a way, they're doing people who who didn't jump on that drop a service and supplying it. But it's also kind of I think it's kind of seen as a little sleazy, just a little opportunistic, and and. And I don't know if that... Uh, oh, supply and demand. Yeah. But I remember, Jim, you showed me a video of a man who bought some hundred-odd yeah. Randall-made knives yeah. for 1200 bucks. Yeah. And that was a killing he made. Yeah. But some might think, maybe you should have spent a little more. But then again, if that's what the person was asking, I... Yeah, that's a hard line when you're buying and reselling because you want to try to be fair with people, but it's not my job to price your items. Everybody always says, well, what do you offer me for it? And I say, No. It's your stuff. I don't know what it's worth. So you tell me a price. And whatever their price is, I'll be honest with you, it's always too high. I will never pay what they say right, is right. their initial offering. You know, So I always come down from there. That's, but you want to see where they're starting. That's their that. starting point, and I always come down from there. Yeah, and I'm sure that gentleman did quite a bit of negotiating before he walked off of the 100 Randall made knives. But, yeah. but um, so collecting – so for your purposes – Yeah, for buying and selling, collecting. For your purposes, Jim, I, I, I would uh, – I would take a look at what people really like, what the most popular knives are. For mm-hmm. instance, the Spyderco Paramilitary II mm-hmm. uh, is probably the most popular knife oh, okay. out there. I mean, just everything is compared to that okay. uh, to, to a great degree. And it has endless variations of, mm-hmm. of color and steel material. Right. And so you could you could decide, well, I'm going to start making money on buying and selling paramilitaries. There's a whole crowd of people out there who love that knife and collect that knife. So I don't think it's sleazy to inject yourself into into a, a community of buyers and sellers for one particular right, knife. Right. Um, well, you, you, most people specialize in something, and then you know they start with something, and then they branch out from there. So right. you know that's kind of what I did in my buying and selling. You know, I always kind of started with one thing to specialize in it before I moved on to another category. Of course, you don't really turn down a good bargain or a good buy if you come across it in something that you're not familiar with, but. We right. still tend to specialize in certain things. Right. So the Spyderco or military tactical kind of knives might be a, a good place to start for someone looking for investment potential or buying and selling and to to kind of increase their collection yes. in other areas. Yes, I, I, I think if you you can always resell a paramilitary too. Mm-hmm. That's the model. Now That's the that. good point. You, there, are, there are certain knives you can always sell yeah. and, and certain knives you're not going to lose too much money on. In my experience, the zero tolerance knives always resell for a nice price. Okay. Um, but one thing no. I wanted to get to before we, uh, before we veer is part of my collecting compulsion is I get enthusiastic about the designs of certain designers and makers hmm. and their designs just resonate with me okay. in a, in a, in a, in a way that you cannot put your finger on. Okay. Tell me, tell me just, one just like any great art. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, designer of this knife, this is a, a 0462 by ZT. Designed by Dmitry Sinkovich. He's a Belarusian designer and maker who makes incredibly, in, in my estimation, incredibly beautiful knives, incredibly beautiful designs. But without Kershaw and their, and their upscale, uh, ZT models, I would never be able to afford anything of his. I wouldn't be able to have, I own three of his designs. I would never be able to have them in my pocket without that opportunity. Hmm. Same goes for this. 
This is a Boker Lateralis. It's a beautiful knife by J.B. Stout. These are custom, fully custom knives, unless you buy this production version, and they go for fifteen hundred bucks. I, I can't do that. Wow! But I can do sixty dollars from Boker. Mm-hmm. Um, so all these knives. This this knife. This is the a uh, an automatic knife. I've mentioned it before. It's the Protec Rock Eye, and this checks two boxes in my uh, collecting categories. It's unique in that it's my only side opening automatic, and it's uh, designed by Les George. Uh, a knife maker and designer that I really admire, whose knives are a little bit out of my reach. Mm. But this ProTech is not. Mm-hmm. So these designers have um, collaborations with production companies, and it's a really good thing. And you can you can put together a really nice collection of really uh, state-of-the-art t- top-end designs mm-hmm. without breaking the bank right. completely. Right. I mean, yeah. Interesting point. Maybe at some point uh, in a future show, it uh, be kind of interesting to talk about designers and designs and, uh, you know, how does one become a, <laughs> a, a top knife designer? I mean, you know, some of those things. But interesting question that popped in my mind when you were talking about the designers and a couple of the knives like this one here you pointed to. Which one was this one? That's the ZT0462. Okay. It doesn't look like any of the other knives you brought with you. It's got more of a kind of like a, it's almost like a bent handle. I mean, it's kind of a, yes. you know, kind of comes up to a point in the middle, kind of. It's got a little slight angle. It's it's kind of futuristic, modernistic, you know. It's got kind of a, a cool shape, cool design. At what point does the designer's design come back to what the collector wants or the, the end user needs in a knife? I mean, how does that mesh together? I, that is a very good question. Um, so, <laughs> so this knife, the 0462, as you mentioned, it has this upswept Persian style blade. It's got this sort of bent pistol grip handle. Mm. It, it presents the blade at an, at an interesting angle in your hands. It's got all these chamfers and this beautiful material. To me, I look at this and I see a designer who was successful in expressing himself in a product. Mm. It's a very graceful knife. There's nothing on this knife to me that looks out of place to my eye. Um, but then you take a look at this knife, which is also a zero tolerance. Uh, maybe a bit of a fanboy, but I love zero tolerance. This is designed by a Brazilian designer called uh, Gustavo Cecchini, or Cecchini, not sure. And uh, this is the 0055. And this knife, it looks like a stealth fighter to me. It's yeah, got, it does. I was going to say it uh, has a Star Wars-like look, almost like a jet fighter kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, it's got angles and facets. It's got an unnecessarily but beautifully compound ground blade. It's got this unique opening mechanism. It's like a flipper, but it was inspired by the the trigger mechanism of a revolver. Hmm. And so this is 100% about the expression of the designer. The designer was going Mm -hmm. for something unique, obviously, and they really came up with it. But when you open it, when the end user opens it, this very, very, very pointy butt, which you can definitely break glass with, digs into your palm. The, the jimping and the hard edge on the side of this little triggering mechanism that opens the blade is, is pretty stout and, and it kind of hurts your fingers. And then you have to pull back hard enough that it jams this into your hand. And mm. what I'm getting at is, is it's not the most comfortable thing to deploy. And then when it's open, it's really only comfortable in this standard forward grip. You put it in reverse grip. You got this sharp thing on your thumb. You know, it's just, you put it in, I guess you could use it in this grip too, right. this reverse grip. But my point is this, did not take much into account with the end user's comfort. This was way more about producing a really unique and cool looking knife that functions. And, and this checks all the boxes. So is that, that one built more for just the collectability versus the yes. usability? Yes. Yeah. And this so is pocket jewelry. Yeah. You know, this is something that I, uh, this is new to me, Jim. So I, I know that I'm going to carry it. Right. But it won't be it won't be one that I carry after the after the honeymoon right. phase. I, right. I won't carry it that much because right. it is more of a showpiece. OK. And so you collect both functional and usable as well as design aesthetic. Yes. Knives. Yes. Yeah. OK. All right. A lot more we could get into. I guess need to kind of wrap it up here before we get into our ships in the night, where you're going to talk about a, a new knife in your collection, the ZT Double Zero Fifty Five. The I one believe. we were just talking yeah, about. We yeah. were just talking about. Um, 
how, how you want to kind of wrap up this, uh, this section here on your collection and kind of talking about uh, needs versus wants and end user, end user need versus this designer <laughs> who okay. apparently had some, him, some needs of himself that doesn't necessarily <laughs> translate to the end needs user. of his own. All right, Tim. Well, uh, this is going to sound a little self-serving, but once you get over the weirdness of being a collector, because it is weird, I, and I'll give you a, for instance, uh, a, a dear old friend of mine, uh, may she rest in peace, uh, had a, a beautiful office, and around her beautiful office, she had a collection of uh, uh, little glass uh, penguins that hmm. I always thought was odd. Hmm. Why do you collect penguins? Because I like them. They make me happy. Okay. Yeah. And I thought that was weird. And then one day, I looked at my pocket knife collection, and I realized, wait a sec, I collect pocket knives. That makes you happy, though. Yeah, they, make, they make me happy, and most people probably think it's weirder than collecting glass penguins. Uh. So once you admit that you're a collector, once you admit you're a knife junkie, once you, <laughs> once you admit you're a knife junkie, then the then the world really opens up to you. You can start start looking for what do I need mm -hmm. and buy that stuff. What do I really like? What do I really want? Mm -hmm. And you can start budgeting things out. It's a it's a huge knife world, and you can these designs by these designers. If you're interested in them, they can mostly you can get most of them for. From budget to mid range to, to high end production, all right. the way to to custom, so that the world is really opened up to collectors. Right. We'd like to hear from you about what you collect, what you look for in a knife. Is it uh, I want it or I need it, or are there certain designers you look for? Uh, give us a call on the listener line at seven two four four six six four four eight seven. That's seven two four four six six four four eight seven. Let us know kind of what you collect, why you collect them, and you may hear yourself on an upcoming issue or episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That's right, and all opinions are welcome. Buy, sell, trade. Keep the addiction healthy and justified. Ships in the night. My recent purchase of the Zero Tolerance 0055, a collaboration with innovative Brazilian knife maker Gustavo Cecchini, was born purely of FOMO, or fear of missing out. ZT announced it would be discontinuing the manufacture of the 0055, and all the online retailers started announcing a sale price on it, so its purchase became a moral imperative. I collect knives for three basic purposes, one as weapons, two as users, and three for their design. This third purpose, design, includes different and unique designs from makers whose custom knives I cannot afford. The ZT0055 falls squarely in this category. It looks like no other knife in your collection, unless you have a custom airborne folder on which it was based. The very sculpted and angular titanium handle looks like a futurist painting and the compound ground blade looks like the wing of some future stealth fighter. It also employs Cecchini's own SLT flipping mechanism, a spring-loaded triggering mechanism inspired by the internals of a Smith & Wesson revolver. Okay, let's get this out of the way. It's a ZT, which means its centered blade is razor sharp, lockup is rock solid, there's zero blade play, and the fit and finish is outstanding. Deployment is interesting. Different. I've heard reviewers indicate that once you ready the spring-loaded SLT flipper, it deploys like a regular flipper. Well, I beg to differ. The blade whips out for sure, but it feels like an extra mechanical element of the retractable trigger slows it down just slightly. Adding to this is the extra sound that comes from the trigger's spring slapping it back into place, concurrent with lockup. I like it. This knife sounds cool, but it's different from a regular flipper. Together, all these unique elements make one super cool, super uncomfortable pocket knife. I would consider this a problem if I intended the ZT0055 to be a user rather than pocket jewelry, which is what it is. When the blade is deployed and you have the knife in a standard forward grip, it's good to go. But the devil's in the deployment. When pulling the SLT flipper, which requires a strong light switch motion, you may experience finger discomfort from the trigger's small size, hard edges, and jimping. You also may find discomfort in the quite pointy handle butt digging deeply into your palm as you steady it to flip. But hey, it's a knife, and an art knife at that. So it's all on me. I'm no Mama Luke. I can take a look at a picture of a pointy and angular knife handle and know it's not just going to melt in my hand and feel great. But the damn thing feels great to my eyes and to my need for endless variety and uniqueness. And that's why I bought it, and that's why I'll keep it. Unless the secondary market prices go through the roof, and I find I'm sitting on a gold mine. How'd you like that upgrade on Ships in the Night? 
Now here's more of the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, Bob, the ZT0055, got a lot of airtime in this show, being the ships in the night. We talked about it a lot in the uh, the main part of the show, but, you know, again, pretty cool looking knife there. It did. I'm in the honeymoon phase, Jim. Yeah, That's yeah. what happens when I okay. get a new knife. Okay. So wrapping up, your collection, but really this is for all knife collectors that we're talking about, just kind of using yours as a point of reference. Needs, wants, end user needs, designer needs, a lot of factors, the aesthetics, how it looks, how it feels, how it uses. Kind of, kind of wrap it up for us when we're talking about knife collecting in a broad sense. Okay. I, I feel like I covered most of that stuff pretty well. I think what I, what I would like to say is that to people who are new to collecting, mm-hmm. don't forget there is a, a vibrant secondary market. Look at Blade Forums. Look at the Usual Suspects Network. There, there are plenty of places to buy knives used. Look at eBay. Um, this is a great opportunity to get your hands on uh, a, a previously loved knife and to really try out. And you might not want to drop the full the full cost on a brand new mm-hmm. knife. Mm-hmm. So don't forget about the secondary market. Right. Also, don't forget that you can sell knives that you have that you don't use that you don't want anymore mm-hmm. on that same market. Just join Blade Forums mm-hmm. and uh, just be straightforward with people. Let them know exactly what they're buying when you describe it. Mm-hmm. Make sure that when you buy a knife, you keep the box and all the internal paperwork and all the all the stuff that comes with the knife. Right. And then if you think you might be selling it down the road because you're just buying it to try it out, well, don't use it too hard. Right. You know, and uh, be straight straightforward with people right. when you tell them right. what you got. And call the knife chunky. Oh, yes, most <laughs> most assuredly. <laughs> if you do want to call the uh, listener line, you have a question, comment, please, 724-466-4487. And Bob mentioned eBay. If you're looking for a knife on eBay, you can visit ebay.thenifejunkie.com. That's ebay.thenifejunkie.com and find your uh, your uh, used or collectible knives there, and uh, you may find uh, find a good bargain. Thanks for listening to episode number five of the Knife Junkie podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Thanks for listening, and please give us a visit at thenifejunkie.com. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 